by two. Wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a definite Happy New Year in the 2020. So thank you all for being here. Great. Okay, Happy Hanukkah too. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Thurman, do you have anything you'd like to share this morning? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Supervisor Craig Brown. He did a, uh, a speech, uh, not only on the Second Amendment, on the veterans, on everything you can imagine, on pro-America, at a Reefs Across America uh, outing that we had last uh, Saturday over in Prescott. Uh, at the uh, VA cemetery, and he did a very good job. Uh, he made this board look good, and uh, he made America look good, so I'm very proud of him for what he did there. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, I was also in Black Canyon City. Uh, here in, uh, at the Camp Verde Library, we had the uh, water uh, group that came out of the U of A doing their water uh, I'm trying to think of the name, I haven't blanked on it, but they, they, they go around in the United States showing how, and to especially the children, on how important water is here? to everybody I'm, in, in I'm America, an and let alone here. the West, and especially the droughty Southwest. And uh, that exhibition now has moved from the Camp Verde Library to the Black Canyon City Cannon School for a while. We, we, uh, we had a ribbon cutting on that, and that was a great, great event there. And the other thing is that I have been known, I was at a VFW uh, a, a group uh, down in Black Canyon City. I've been known to be the pooper scooper in the Black Canyon City Parade for uh, about 17 years now. And they, so they brought it up that I had done that and, uh, and they gave me a, a new wheelbarrow. <laughs> I guess I, I got to do it for a little while longer, so that's enough. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. It's nice that people appreciate your work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I shovel it during the week. I might as well shovel it on the weekend. Too. Uh, Supervisor Simmons, do you have anything you'd like to share? Thank you. Uh, and Merry Christmas to everybody. I just want to start this out since we've got such a crowd here and let most of you know that at least, at least three of us up here have CCWs. And so, I wanted to hit that off a little bit. I certainly don't want to be on the wrong side of you guys. <laughs> I, uh, I had the pleasure of attending the Whiskey Row Alley Mural Ribbon Cutting uh, last Friday. And I don't know if you've driven by it. It's right behind the St. Michael's Hotel. And they're cleaning up the alley back there. They've done a beautiful mural up there. There's a little more that's going to be done. It was really a fantastic day. Uh, I want to wish the uh, directors and all the staff a very Merry Christmas and joyous New Year. And now you've all woke up in the middle of the night just aching to know this stuff that I'm going to tell you right now. So let's put this to bed. Today is National Twin Day. I'm sure you didn't know that. It's also National Roast Suckling Pig Day. It really warms your heart, doesn't it? Pork chop. And here we go. The final thing that it is today is answer the telephone like Buddy the Elf Day. So for those of you who woke up confused, I've just straightened out your day for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Brown, what would you like to share this morning? Uh, I just want to say good morning and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody. And I know this is going to be a great year moving forward. Uh, I want to mention that I want to thank everybody for the support moving into the chair position this next year. And I hope I do as well and get a job as you did this last year. Excel, sir. And I want to mention uh, we had. Uh, I went to the RTAC meeting while you were meeting with our legislative representatives up here. I went to Phoenix to meet with our legislative representative, Mr. Campbell, in regard to rural transportation issues, and he didn't show up. So, so it was a wasted trip in many ways. However, we'll look forward. We've had these conversations with him before, and hopefully we'll be moving forward with some legislation that will be effective. And, render more money coming to the counties and the rural areas to take care of our issues on our roads. Uh, also participated in the RAC, which was a determination from by the USDA on where we're going to spend 
seventy plus million dollars and came up with a total of five thirty five to ten different projects. It's on the USDA website. They published it yesterday and they're on different projects on both sides of the hill. And quite a, I just read them all out to you, but a lot we got a lot of verbiage. So if you want to look it up, there's the money to be allocated and it will be approved and move forward with that for this next year. It's a two-year program out of Title II federal money. So your federal taxes have worked here in Yamapai County. So, uh, ten of the tree lighting, obviously, at the uh, plaza, and it was a wonderful affair, and I want to thank facilities for making sure all the trees lit up all at the same time. Because the night before, they didn't. So we had to make some adjustments. We are moving forward with APS on possibly uh, changing out some of the lighting that's old and uh, get it replaced this next year. I've got a meeting with them this next couple of weeks and facilities and hopefully we'll be able to move forward with that and APS is going to make the donation to the county. So we're looking forward to that. G Posse had their installation dinner last Thursday night. Mary Mallory and I attended that and uh, along with the sheriff and uh, some other dignitaries and it was really encouraging to see our G Posse volunteers there and just want to say that if you're a member of a volunteer group like G Posse, you got my support. So, And we were at the murals also with Roly and it's really something they've got apparently, President's got some money left over for the mural program so they're going to do a second mural. And we're not sure exactly where it'll be, but they're planning on doing it. And they really plan on dressing up that alley that's to the uh, west of uh, Montezuma, behind the Pacifico area. So, looking forward to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, you probably won't be here for the end of the meeting, so I'll make sure I share it now. Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Holidays, and please have a safe and prosperous new year as we move forward with our 2020. Uh, we, some of you probably won't stick around after we have your section on this agenda, but we have a representative here today to share the Census 2020 information with us. It's vitally important to this county and to this state that you participate in the Census. So please uh, watch for that information coming forward. Do what you can to help spread the word. We're actually uh, hiring people to go out and help with the census currently. So if you've got an inclination to get out and beat the streets uh, for a good cause, that would be one. Uh, the every person counted equates out to about twenty thousand dollars over ten years that comes into this state and to this county. And so uh, a lot of the programs and services that we provide uh, are. They, they really count on a good count, and so please participate. We need those numbers uh, so we can provide, continue to provide robust services for you. Uh, we have uh, Wendy Rogers in the front row. Thank you, ma'am, for being here this morning. Uh, we recently met with uh, some of our legislative representatives and talked about some issues that we have uh, and some concerns we have going forward into this legislative season. Uh, Karen Van, the President of the Senate, let us know that they expect to be moving through the session fairly quickly this year. The budget is number one priority for them. So they're going to be really uh, focusing on getting the budget done as quickly as possible. And hopefully we can get them to do a few other things while they're there. Uh, some of the items that we put forward that we're asking for some support on is uh, currently if you're a county of 500,000 people or more, which only means Maricopa and Pinal, uh, Pima, you're, you're allowed to collect a bed tax in unincorporated areas. So we're asking for that 500,000 uh, limit on population to be removed. We have quite a few communities that would be uh, served very well and uh, allow us to create an income stream to provide more robust services in those, those communities if we were allowed to implement a bed tax countywide just like cities and towns are able to do currently. So. Uh, we're hoping to get some support there. We also are asking them for some support on Title 36. Title 36 is a restore to competency. It has to do with mental health. We have people that tend to get in our system and find themselves in a uh, perpetual uh, in and out system, situation because they create a problem or end up in a problem, uh, get put in jail, get brought before court. Court has to turn them loose because they don't have a way to deal with their issues. 
uh, where they go back into society and create the problem all over again and it just ends up being this constant loop. So we're hoping that the state will step up and, and put some legislation in place to put some benefits and some services in front of the people that need those so we can quit spending our sheriff's time and our jail's time and the public's time and money dealing with an issue that could be better served by getting people the help they need. Uh, also, we're asking for the, the state to step up and do some changes to the legislation on short-term rentals. Short-term rentals has been uh, 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 devastating for workforce housing and places like the Verde Valley and other places around the county and the state of Arizona. So uh, they opened a Pandora's box with the legislation they created years ago and uh, it's really caused some serious problems and so we're asking for them to scale it back a little bit and help us allow communities to speak up for themselves and create a some type of a win-win out of this whole short-term rental debacle so uh, we're asking for support there and also we're asking for uh, some support to increase the exemption on for property taxes for seniors and disabled so uh, that seems to be getting some traction we're hoping that'll help and it'll allow you to collect a little more money before you have to worry about paying taxes uh, your property taxes so Hopefully we get some traction there as well. Uh, the county participated this last weekend in the uh, Christmas parade right here in Cottonwood. Um, our facilities department uh, did a bang up job creating a float. We had a lot of participation from our staff and members of the Yavpai family and uh, it was a great time. I have never seen so many children at a parade before. It was fantastic. I brought a thousand candy canes and I was out within the first third of the parade. <laughs> I, uh, I bought out of my own pocket about $140 worth of uh, Tootsie Rolls, which is thousands, and we gave them all away. It was amazing. The street was littered with Tootsie Rolls when we got down. Hopefully a lot of them went down. By the way, I owe you another thousand Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the Chocolate Walk, participated in the Chocolate Walk, which was right after the uh, parade uh, in Old Town. So everybody ended up the parade in Old Town, and most of them stuck around and walked the streets. And if they didn't get enough chocolate during the parade, they definitely got their fill walking up and down. It was a, a great day to be in Cottonwood, and, and uh, it, it's, it's amazing to see economic development in full bloom. Um, the economy is doing fantastic right now. Everything's robust. and. People are out, people were happy, cheerful. It was really nice seeing uh, so much camaraderie on the streets in Old Town. And, and I know being over in Prescott as much as we are, it's, it's everywhere. It's really nice to see people enjoying the season for what it really is this year. So uh, thank you all for participating in either of those events. Uh, the artwork today, um, we have artwork on the walls. If none of you noticed, um, it's nice to have some color back in the room. These are the students from Mountain View Preparatory right here in Birdie Village, part of the Cottonwood Oak Creek School System. And their art teacher this year decided that uh, they were gonna learn to use a cell phone as a, uh, as a point of, of creating art. So every one of these photographs was taken with a cell phone. They, so they learned to do composition, they learned to work different apps to modify the photos that were taken and then they created all this beautiful artwork in front of you. So uh, we have some really great students, great, great young kids, young people here in the Verde Valley and Prescott and the county, and, and we really love that we get to bring their art in and show it off once in a while. So please take a look at it before you leave the room. It's, it's, it's really nice to have it here. Uh, starts the day in a very good way. And their theme this year was uh, photograph is worth a thousand words. And I think if you look at some of these, you'll you'll see your thousand words right there. So mm -hmm. thank the students from Mountain View Preparatory for bringing us the artwork. Uh, and with that, uh, once again, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and we'll move on with our agenda. Uh, the next item up will be awards and proclamations. Today we have uh, before us the approval of proclamation recognizing Yavapai County, Yavapai at Work, one-stop system for successfully executing the workforce development activities and providing positive outcomes for 2018-2019. So I will. Chairman? Yes, sir. I move we approve the proclamation you have just stated. I'll second the motion. So we have a motion by Supervisor Simmons. We have a second by Vice, Vice Chair Brown. I will read the proclamation, at which point I'm going to ask Ms. Drew if uh, she can come up and accept this. And we have Mr. Tovery, uh, the, the uh, former mayor of Jerome, who also sits on the Workforce Development Board, to come up and, and 
accept this as well. Uh, Yapai County One Stop System. Whereas the Yapai County Workforce Development Board is uniquely qualified to be the catalyst for business and labor attraction and retention and plays a vital role in contributing to a healthy regional economies. And whereas the county's workforce board is led by local business leaders and service providers in partnership with the state and federal funding partners <coughs> who dedicate their time to developing strategies to build a sustainable and talented workforce in our service area. And whereas the workforce development board through Yavapai at Work One Stop System provides direct client services including career counseling, tuition assistance, paid on the job <coughs> skills training, apprenticeships and support services for job placement. And whereas the Yavapai County Yavapai at Work one-stop system has successfully executed workforce development activities demonstrating positive outcomes during the program year 2018-2019 by serving 8,953 clients and partnering in creating 554 jobs with a 97% job retention rate. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Yavapai County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaim in concert with the Northern Arizona Council of Governments their support for the Yavapai at Work one-stop system and the benefits it provides to residents of Yavapai County. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the council, um, Phil Tobri, our vice chairman, and <coughs> Mr. Cabbage, our operations manager, and um, Elaine Bremner, who has been a long-term member and supporter of the workforce board. Um, but our work is not um, without the efforts and support of the board of supervisors. Um, so thank you all for always standing behind us, for always supporting um, workforce development in Yavapai County. Um, Mr. Bardon is by my side all the time. I appreciate it, and um, thank you for this. Well, I want to tell you, people don't, um, unless you've uh, had to change your job skills, in the middle of your career path or uh, find yourself out of work and, and need to figure out how to put yourself back into gainful employment. You don't necessarily understand just the work that you do and, and how meaningful what you do is to the families and the citizens in our county. And uh, uh, being part of NACOG, uh, which is the Northern Arizona Council of Governments, uh, captures most of the counties in the top part of the state and we get together on a uh, quarterly basis and, and learn how to and spread out federal monies and sustain programs. Uh, it's absolutely amazing that Yavapai tends to always be at the top of the list when it comes to being innovative and creating sustainable solutions and this is absolutely one of those. So uh, thank you for what you do and for allowing us to participate in your success. Can we go down? And We've got a vote. Oh, yes. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We're going to come down and, and hand out.
So we're going to switch it up just a little bit this morning because we have a very uh, active and attentive crowd. And I thank you all very much for being here and showing what a republic is all about. Uh, we are going to do call to the public. I have quite a few green sheets. If you would like to speak and you haven't filled one out, please do uh, and turn one in for us. We need that for our records. Uh, we are going to, uh, right after call to the public, we are going to have a presentation. Uh, let me get to that part of the agenda because it's way down here. We're gonna have a presentation uh, supporting the Second Amendment of the Constitution. So uh, during that presentation, we're gonna have three speakers that will get up and give that presentation. They're gonna have 10 minutes or so to do that with. But if you would like to speak on this topic, we're going to go ahead and take that during call to the public, and you'll have three minutes to come up and share your uh, support or not for this item uh, or anything else you'd like to talk about. We only have one other green sheet, and it is for a hearing item. So uh, if you do want to speak on whatever subject, please fill out one of those forms and turn it in for us. So uh, first off, we have... Uh, we have Mark and Joanne Cole out of Camp Verde. They do not wish to speak. They are in for, favor of supporting the Second Amendment sanctuary status for the county. Thank you for your concerns and interest. We have Benjamin Clark Jr. from Prescott. Uh, does not wish to speak. Uh, is in support of the resolution on Second Amendment. Thank you, sir. Uh, so next up we have Daniel McCarty. Right behind that, we're going to have Dr. Shakas. Thank you, sir. You're next after Mr. McCarty. Three minutes? Three minutes, please. Three minutes? Yes, sir. Hey, Mary. Tom? This morning, sir. Great to meet some of you for the first time. I hate the fact that we have to meet under these conditions. Um, we need leadership at the county level now because we unfortunately have leaders in this country that are starting to popularize and authorize some of the most dangerous laws and legislation we've ever seen. The unfortunate part about this is that the measure that you're taking is not only needed, the unfortunate part about it is, is that if you don't take these measures or if we do not mobilize and start taking these measures, the ramifications could be dire for <coughs> your children, your grandchildren, in ways that we never anticipated. The government has demonstrated what it will do as soon as you open up doors. And this is not a door we're willing to open. So at the county level, we appreciate all of you in advance for passing this resolution, for making sure that you make a stand, you tell the governor, you tell this country that Yavapai County is a safe place for our Second Amendment rights. Okay? And uh, I, I won't sit here and grandstand, but um, thank you for your leadership in this matter. Thank you for everybody in this room for stepping up and mobilizing. And this is the start of this. This will continue statewide. So it's uh, fantastic that you're going to join Mojave County in this leadership effort. So thank you very much. those that don't know me you okay? I'm good thank you for those that don't know me my name is dr. Bill Chakas um, I've been a resident of this county eight years next month um, you mentioned uh, Mountain View Prep earlier I volunteer there once a month I teach uh, a fourth grade class American history and patriotism I'm a retired educator football coach sports writer and from 1979 to 1991 I was a United States Army helicopter pilot and for the last nine and a half years of that I flew for the Special Operations Command. Uh, like I said, there are many people in this room that know who I am because I helped run a group called Yavapai County Preparedness, which is a division of Arizona Oath Keepers. 
and um, I run the Verde Valley section, and there's some people here from the uh, Chino Valley group as well. Um, we're in favor of this because obviously we're a border state. Uh, there have been instances already of illegals as far north as Prescott, and I wouldn't be surprised if they're getting away with being further up here. We have uh, lots of crime coming into the area. Um, I myself was almost assaulted a few months back at the Safeway Shopping Center. If I wasn't street smart and formerly from the Bronx, I probably would have got ripped off. Um, we really need this to get done. Uh, like Mr. McCarthy said, and I hate him stealing my thunder, but he's a worthy guy to do it. Uh, we need uh, our elected and appointed government to support the Constitution, especially the first ten, the Bill of Rights. Because without the Second Amendment, we don't have the other nine. And um, it's very important. It's very important to me. It's what I taught back in New York City, and it's what I teach here. And I would hate to see uh, a governor who is a Republican in name only uh, pass this law. This will be the fourth year in a row that he's going to try. And apparently, there is more and more support in the state legislature. So we're calling on all of you to speak with our state representatives and get them on board with this. And in the spirit of Congress, I'll yield the remainder of my time when I was like back to the board. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Next up, we have Chris Cucino, and then right behind that, we have John Stankowitz. Thank you. Oh, I got to stay for John. Thank you. Um, you guys, there's there's this fungus growing in this country, and it needs to get eradicated. It's it's spread to Arizona, and it's called red flag laws. Um, they're getting popular all over the place. Last time the the governor, and I can't believe a Republican governor is doing this, but he he put it across as safe Arizona schools, and they published this pamphlet. So it's trying to be sold as uh, as a school safety thing. We got to help the kids, but it goes way beyond uh, that. I think there's already laws that cover most of the things that could be bad, but the scope could grow exponentially huge. Um, we're including behavioral and mental health professionals. And this is what these professionals say and think about us. That 20% uh, of the youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. That's one in five kids they are saying has a mental health condition. They're saying that 10% of the youth ages 13 to 18 have a behavioral or conduct disorder, which would make them uh, subject possibly to red flag. And this reaches beyond the child itself. Um, this, in their plan, in their words, they say our plan increases the penalty for any parent or guardian of a minor found guilty of illegally possessing a firearm. So now not only can you tap the kid, now you can get to the parents. Um, violators are subject to a class four felony and would face a minimum of a year and up to almost four years in prison. They have set up in this plan a, a anonymous hotline so now you don't even have to face your accuser anymore. It can be an anonymous tip that sends somebody to your house. You know, you don't like somebody, you could say, you know what, I heard these things. It's, it, I think you gotta send people over there. The scope can get really bad on this. Some states have already let this sucker out of the box. Maryland has already rated over 200 people on this. Uh, Virginia is actually considering calling out the National Guard to enforce their red flag laws. Once you let this out of the box, it can just go. And with these, uh, these mental health professionals, these are the same people that said, our president is incompetent to run this country. He needs to go down because he's crazy. Now we're going to put them in charge of, of our Second Amendment rights. And that's not right. So please support this uh, proclamation. All it really does, it really gives you guys cover, if anything. You know, you can say, well, we voted for this because it's coming from the state. And I tell you what, there's a lot of people that are going to fight it when it's at the state. Thank you very much. I, I failed to let everybody know. We, we need you to state your name and where you're from. I don't need your physical address, but if you let us know where you're from, for the record, please. Sure, I'm Chris Cucneo, and I'm from Prescott, Arizona, and I love to drive over here, meet here anytime. Great. Thank you, sir. And you're not anonymous. Thank you.
All right, we have John Stankwitz next, and behind that, Mark Smith. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is John Stankiewicz. I'm from Chino Valley, Arizona. I am the CEO of the Compass Training Center, AZ, which is also in Chino Valley, Arizona. That is our, since August 1st, new shooting range there in Chino. Uh, prior to that and continually now, I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Nielsen Training and Consulting. We are a firearms training and consulting organization uh, that conducts firearms training to law-abiding citizens throughout the United States. Thank you for giving me a moment to speak. We are talking today about what is happening with the Second Amendment, what is happening with how people can be reported. And I'll be brief, because I know you have a lot of people speaking today. We were just talking about people with mental health issues or perceived mental health issues, having their guns taken away, parents being uh, uh, burdened with that as well. Last year, I traveled to Austin, Texas, Houston, Texas, Mobile, Alabama, and Carthage, North Carolina to conduct training to law-abiding citizens in this country. If current legislation keeps going forward in the state of Virginia, I would be a class five felon. Me, I've been doing this for 33 years. I was teaching cops active shooter drills about 10 minutes after Columbine happened. I had a career as a police officer. I'm honorably discharged from the United States Navy. I'm a past commander of two VFW posts. And if I walk into the state of Virginia, I could potentially be a felon. I don't know what a class five felon is, but I know what a felony is. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to all of us. Arizona and Virginia are not next to one another, but we have a couple things in common. We're both in the United States of America and we're both supposed to be abiding by the Constitution. Amen. There are things that need to be done to put a stop to senseless mass shootings. And I will volunteer my time to help get us there. But we need to stick up for our own rights. If it can happen to me, potentially, any place in this country, it can happen to any one of you, and it can happen to any one of you. I strongly urge you to support making Yavapai County a Second Amendment county. Um, before we have Mr. Smith get up and talk, can you all hear out in the lobby? Do we need to turn that up for you? Thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, Mark Smith is up next, please. And behind that we have Maria Lyman. Lynam? Lynam. Morning, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Mark Smith. I'm a resident of Chino Valley, Arizona. Mm -hmm. I'm here today to speak about the difference between a Second Amendment Sanctuary Resolution and a Second Amendment Sanctuary Ordinance. And to provide the Board of Supervisors with a draft ordinance, which is what I hope you're getting right now, uh, as written by the Gun Owners of America. Simply stated, a resolution by the Board carries no legal weight, provides no backup for law enforcement if and when they follow their oath of office and refuse to enforce illegal gun control laws. On the other hand, the draft ordinance that I presented to the board does carry the full legal authority of the board, does provide full backup to law enforcement and other public employees who follow their oath of office and refuse to enforce illegal gun control laws. The draft as presented to the board provides proper exemptions duly noted in the draft, penalties, due process procedures, and still allows citizens to follow illegal gun control laws if they so choose to do so voluntarily without penalty. The draft, in fact, is being passed in hundreds of cities and counties across the country, as we here in Yavapai County should set the example for Arizona and pass this as an ordinance without delay. And I, I would like to emphasize as an ordinance. I know we won't do that here today because the council needs to review it. Doing so would show your support for your oath of office and your support for the second, the fourth, the fifth, the ninth, the 10th and the 14th amendments of the Constitution of the United States. Stand up for America. Stand up for Arizona. Stand up for Yavapai County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up we have Maria Linen and behind that Randy Miller. Good morning. Good morning. 
I too was at the mural ceremony and it's good to see you all again. Um, I, I know that Yavapai County has a historic gun culture, but what we're talking about here is potentially banning the any ordinance on high capacity magazine assault rifles, opposing the red flag laws, opposing banning the purchase of guns by a perpetrator of domestic violence, and potentially and historically these people are mass shooters. It was my understanding that what is known as a red flag law permits police or family members to petition a state court to order the temporary removal of firearms from a person who may present a danger to others. It is not the um, instant gratification of someone to go and take away somebody's gun. We all know that gun control is a hot button topic especially for those that own guns. I do not want to take away anyone's right to own a gun, but we need common sense gun laws, as this gentleman said. Hey, please keep it down or we'll, we'll have I was very courteous to you all, yes, and I will be, and I think I deserve the respect of Absolutely. the people here. Yes, ma'am. Continue Everyone on. Everyone cannot agree on this issue, so, and you are aware of it, which is why we are all here. Ma'am, address the board. So, I just 100 Americans are killed by guns every day, and hundreds more are injured. I would think you'd want to protect your citizens, not open this up, not open us all up to injury. Just in Arizona alone in 2018, there were 279 gun-related deaths and 270 injuries that included those of six children under the age of 11, 31 teens under the age of between 12 and 17. There were two mass shootings and nine officers killed or shot. 94 were killed in officer involved subject and suspect shootings. 22 people were killed in home invasions, 33 in defensive use, and there were 16 unintentional shootings. This year in Arizona, the total number of shooting deaths from all causes to date increased, with the exception of officer-involved incidents. Mass shootings increased from two to six, and a mass shooting is um, considered anyone over, or yeah, than when any, when more than four people are involved in a shooting. It's over time, time's expired. By, Please finish. By refusing to enforce specific laws or appropriate funds toward their enforcement, this board would severely limit the impact of laws passed by the state or federal government. If you consider a resolution making our county a second amendment sanctuary, I trust, and or ordinance, I trust right. you will call for town halls in your districts and ask Stop. your constituents what they would want. So thank you, ma'am. Equal enforcement of the law. Stop. Show respect. Please. Thank you for sharing your concerns with us this morning. Uh, next up, we have Randy Miller, and behind that, we have Alan Johnson. And Mr. Burdon, could you get could you get a count? It would be nice to have a count who's participating today. Anyway, thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm glad this woman had an opportunity to make her presentation. My name is Randy Miller, and I'm the Arizona Director for the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, uh, retired law enforcement, and uh, I teach the Constitution. And I'm very familiar with statistics that were just reported, and there's two sides to every story, and I would like to have the opportunity to speak with this woman when we're done. But I, I submitted a letter to you all via email. I don't know if you got it. I'd like, it was it entered on the record. I have copies if you need it. Uh, and I want to point out to you that today, the Bill of Rights was ratified as a promise because the anti-federalists believed that there was no guarantees for the people in there. It gave too much privileges to the general government and rights and not enough to the people. And it was, it was fulfilled and the Bill of Rights was ratified, one of the things that your holidays missed was we just had a holiday that should be celebrated December 15th, which is the National Bill of Rights Day. That's when it was ratified, 1791. And I'd like to read to you the preamble of the Bill of Rights. 
It says, uh, the conventions of a number of states having at the time of their here, the adopting the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added and as extending the ground of public confidence in government will best ensure the benefit ends of its institution. Now that's the first paragraph. Restrictive and declar de declarative statements. By the way, government, these are hands off, meaning you have no right and no legislative powers over the rights of the people. I'm going to read the last couple sections of my letter to you all so the people know. Arizona state constitution is clear as to where you and all government derives its powers and where the powers rest. Article 2, Declaration of Rights of Arizona's Constitution, Section 2, says, All political power is inherent in the people. These people here in this room have political power. It comes from them granted to you all. Government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed, and government is established to protect and maintain individual rights. Your purpose is to maintain the rights of the people. All these statistics that were written, if you want to look at those, let's look at hammers. More people are killed by hammers than firearms. Should we outlaw hammers? Or have contractors register their hammer with you all? I don't think so. Herein lies your responsibility and purpose which should make your decision easy, requiring little thought. You took an oath. Your position is in service to the people and your responsibility is clear. Government has no legislative authority over the rights of the people. If this were so, then they wouldn't be rights and they, would be, they can be changed at will of those in charge. The people and I are here before you not to ask you to protect our rights. You already promised this when you took your oath. We are asking you to, be, to uphold your promise to the people and vote in accordance to it. I thank you for your time. Thanks, sir. Could you please... Uh, Randy Miller, and I drove up here from Phoenix. It's a little warmer down there, but yeah, I enjoy your community. Thank you. Thank you very much for making the drive and sharing your concerns with us. Um, I want to remind everybody this is this is a public forum um, it's our board meeting it's you know so please address the board we are anxious and uh, we're, we want to hear what you have to say regardless of how you feel that's that's one of the rights our Constitution has provided us is the ability to, to gather and share our concerns and our opinions with each other mm -hmm. so please allow everybody to do that in a very respectful manner thank you um, we have Alan Johnson up and behind that we have Brian Tegardu. Tegardu. thank you sir <laughs> hello my name is Alan Johnson I live locally here in Clarkdale uh, I came to this meeting because of obviously the gun laws and legislation that's trying to be passed in not just in Arizona in our country uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, the Second Amendment was given to the people for protection of themselves, not only from their neighbors, but from also from government. Uh, back in 1776, when we became a nation, before we became a sovereign nation, we were actually British colonial citizens who were defending ourselves from a British army that came to attack its own citizens and implement their laws and oppress the people. Uh, once we became a sovereign nation, the Constitution was written uh, to, to restrain government from overseeing powers over the people. And the Second Amendment was written to guarantee the people the right to defend themselves if an oppressive government ever came back. Uh, what's going on in Virginia right now is a perfect example of history getting ready to repeat itself. Uh, the, the Bill of Rights is the rights of the people, and the rights of the people are not under the jurisdiction of government, of any government body. Those rights belong to the people, and the Constitution guarantees that the governing bodies will protect and preserve those rights. Uh, any gun legislation is an infringement upon the Second, Second Amendment. <coughs> and with that being said, I just want to 
recite two quotes, two of my favorite quotes from the author of uh, the Second Amendment, Alexander Hamilton. One of them being, the Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. The second quote of his that I really like is, a well-regulated militia is the most natural, natural defense of a free country. As free citizens, we have the right to own and bear arms to protect ourselves from any threat, whether it's domestic, whether it's foreign, uh, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's a herd of deer about to trample us, it, it's our right to own these guns. Uh, good people do good things with them, bad people do bad things with them, but it doesn't matter what the tool is, bad people will do bad things. Good people will be there to protect innocence from bad people. Uh, I, I don't agree with any gun confiscation law, red flag law, or any um, any laws against guns, magazine capacity, or anything such. Uh, I would really like to see the council uh, protect these rights and have Yavapai County become a Second Amendment sanctuary county. Thank you. Great job. We have a Brian Tigardu and yes, then Tigardu, and after that, Lauren. <coughs> Howdy, my name is Brian Teagarden. I'm from Paulden, Arizona. My family's been in the territory since 1880. My great granddad was one of the first Arizona Rangers. Okay, so when you talk about being Sanctuary City, it's about our county and everything, it's about time. It's about time. And I'll, I'll be danged if I'm giving up my gun rights or somebody come up on there, I'll guarantee you. My family's been here and we fought everybody and anybody to make sure this was a safe territory. So thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next up we have Lauren Brill. Bria. Bria. Sorry. And behind that, Rose Ferry. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Please state your name and where you're from for the record. Lauren Bria from Prescott Valley. Thank you. We've already seen what laws based on extreme unusual circumstances do to our country with abortion right mm -hmm. we've had millions of babies murdered and women's lives ruined mm -hmm. so are we going to do the same thing again with our second amendment are we going to ruin our country our people our constitution by these extreme situations that arise because of bad people these bad people do these things because they're bad. The good people who have the guns aren't going to do those things. So we need to stand up, stand up for the people of the nation, stand up for the Constitution, stand up for our Second Amendment rights, and prohibit that from happening in this county by making that ordinance, making this a second sanctuary county and passing it as an ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Rose Ferry, and behind that we have Sherry Mitchell. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me this privilege to speak to you. It was not gun violence that killed our daughter, Michelle, our only daughter, in 1984 at the McDonald's Massacre in San Isidro, California. It was a human being, not a gun. It took SWAT team 20 minutes to show up. Meanwhile, 21 people were murdered by a man and not a gun. We often have wondered through the years since we lost our daughter how things would have turned out if people in that restaurant had been permitted to carry something to protect them. Maybe not all those lives, those 21 lives, would not have been wasted like our daughters. I ask you all today to honor the memory of my daughter and all those other children that have lost their lives since then and prior to then in schools, in restaurants, in theaters, that you honor them and respect their memory by passing this resolution that we have presented, we will present today. 
Thank you. I yield. Rose, I think I can speak for the entire board. Uh, we are sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing with us this morning. Uh, next up, we have Sherry Mitchell. Uh, does not wish to speak. We need Second Amendment protection. Chicago has one of the strictest gun laws in the U.S. and has one of the highest rates of crime. Anyone wanting red flag laws needs to go live in Chicago or better. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your concerns. Next up, we have Ms. Penny Pugh, who will be here uh, presenting a letter from our Congressman Paul Gosar. Ms. Pugh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairman Garrison, members of the board. Uh, it's my honor to be here on behalf of Congressman Gosar, who strongly supports this resolution. For the following reasons, uh, which are outlined, each of you have a copy of the letter that uh, uh, the Congressman sends. It says, Dear Supervisors, I am in Washington, D.C. today, stuck, voting to stop a grave injustice to our president, a fake impeachment effort that was planned before the president was even sworn into office. I have opposed this hoax on the American public, and I remain in D.C. to continue the fight this week. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the issue of our God-given right to self-defense. Our founding fathers were brilliant people who understood that every person has a right to defend themselves, their families, and their country. This right to self-defense can involve the right to defend against violent criminals. It can also mean the right to defend our communities from a, an oppressive government. History teaches us that both of these events occur and the people have a right to be ready when and if they do. I voice my support to the Mojave County Supervisors when they passed a similar resolution. Here's why. There are people in Arizona and in Washington, D.C. who truly want to stop Americans from being able to effectively defend themselves. They use the tired topics of gun violence as their cudgel while ignoring all other forms of violence. And they ignore this realism. When confronted by a bad guy with a gun, the only hope for self-defense will be another person with a gun. Rocks and sticks won't cut it. If the gun-grabbing leftists want to address crime and violence in this country, we are ready to talk real solutions. Strict, harsh, and certain criminal punishment for violent criminals is a standard that history shows works. What can equalize the strength disparity between a 110 pound woman and her 220 pound <coughs> attempted rapist? A gun. What can equalize the strength disparity between a 75 year old retiree and the two youthful thugs entering her residence for a home invasion? Her gun. The list is endless. Self defense is necessary and it is our right. Today we face aggressive, loud, and irrational people who want to ban guns and leave gun ownership only in the hands of the government. The same government, they complain as racist, <laughs> oppressive, unfair, incompetent, and overbearing. The same government, they shoot unarmed or innocent people. These gun-grabbing left leftists are well-funded by billionaires and oligarchs. These billionaires live behind gated communities, protected by armed guards, and travel with armed guards and bulletproof <coughs> vehicles. They pay for their security, but they want you to be helpless. They can push off. Yeah. <laughs> Enough. Let the world know that in Yavapai County, the right to self-defense will be defended. Remember, there is no First Amendment without the Second Amendment. Paul Gosar. Thank you, Ms. Pugh. Thank you for, and uh, thank the Congressman for us for taking the time to share his opinion and concerns with the board. So thank you very much. Uh, we have Elliot Schulman uh, from Prescott, uh, wishes not to speak, is in favor of this item. It is essential that every American community take a strong stand against the movement to subtly remove Americans from the umbrella of the Constitution, principally the Second Amendment. A loud statement of a sanctuary for the Second Amendment protection is essential. Thank you, sir. Uh, and we have William Ortiz from Prescott also does not wish to speak in favor of this uh, concern. I am sanctuary staunchly in favor, sorry, making Yapai County a Second Amendment sanctuary. 
The Second Amendment is the only thing standing between freedom and tyranny, and any attempt to limit it will eventually lead to tyranny and authoritarian, authoritarianism. So thank you for sharing your concerns. Uh, do we have anybody on the other side of the mountain? Thank you for being a crowd today. Uh, welcome to our meeting. Does anybody over there have anything they'd like to share? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. There's no one here that would like to share their comments. Great. Thank you very much for participating and watching the meeting. Uh, with that, uh, we will move on to the actual presentation on this item. Uh, we will have three people that are wishing to come up and present this. It will be uh, John Mitchell, Drake Mitchell, and Myrna Lieberman. Could you please present in that order? And you have about 10 minutes collectively amongst you. So thank you very much for being here today. Before you get started, I, I want to make sure everybody in this room understands who you're talking to and, and our, our belief in not only our job, but what we signed up to do and the oath that we took. We, we swore our hand on the Bible stating we would protect the rules and the, and the regulations of the country and, and our state, uh, upholding both constitutions. And you're not going to walk into an office of any of the people sitting up here and not find a copy of our Constitution Bill of Rights on our desk, if not also framed on, on our walls. So we very much understand the duties that have been given to us and the rights that you have and our need to protect them. So so I hope I hope you don't think we're... I just want to make sure we put that out there because we keep getting told we have to up, uphold the Constitution. I think we know that very well. So thank you very much. Certainly, and um, greetings, uh, honorable board members. What I'm going to do briefly is uh, I'll, I'll probably um, bypass some of the comments because some of them were made, uh, I think, better than I could have made them. But um, I wanted to address you first. Greetings to all you honorable board members. I appreciate what you're doing, and, and I really appreciate the process and the time you've given Chairman Garrison, uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Simmons, Mr. Thurman, and Ms. Mallory. I'm John Mitchell from Cottonwood, Arizona, and I, I just wanted to read these through. You all have um, copies of these, so I, I'm going to move through this rather quickly. I sincerely wish I didn't have to be there, nor take time to uh, hear, the pro hear, uh, hear this proposition or discussion of these matters being already codified into national st and state law, yet presently constitutionally illegal political circumstances compel me to come and plead with you all, <clears throat> trusting that you will understand the nature and need for a Second Amendment sanctuary resolution. And in that copy, you'll find a graphic of what I'm speaking about that's growing right now. The only thing I wanted to cover quickly is what are rights and what are privileges? Rights are recognized by men as societal norms and a freedom, in a form of freedoms that are available to people by virtue of being citizens of a country and members of a society. Rights are generally known to be considered fundamental and inalienable. Privileges are special benefits or permissions granted to an individual or group based upon status, class, rank, title, or special talent. Rights come from God and his authority recognized by men. Privileges are granted by men. And um, essentially what I wanted to do here in closing is uh, my serious concern and what I absolutely don't want to see is increased felt desperation grow on the part of many free, law-abiding, and constitutionally knowledgeable citizens who treasure all these enumerated rights as given by God. Um, I know I, now my prayer and hope is that you as elected representatives uh, in a body will do the right thing for all of us for as local or I'm sorry as law-abiding and tax-paying citizens I know we will be watching and standing thank you thank you sir I would like to thank the board for allowing us time to speak thank my fellow veterans and the citizens of Yavapai County for attending much has been said about the Second Amendment. Very little has been said about the Arizona Constitution. Part of Section 26 of the Arizona Constitution is titled Bearing Arms, and part of it reads, the right of the individual citizen to bear arms in defense of himself or the state shall not be impaired. 
it's even clearer than the Second Amendment. So there is no ambiguity in what you're doing. Now, you've been asked to do a resolution. We feel that is something quick and easy that you could do here today. It's not making a law. It's not enforcing any fines or punishments. It's not creating a crime. It's basically asking you to say you, you will follow the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the state Constitution. We also have put forward, apparently now, several ordinances. Mine, um, if you'll look in your handouts, it's got handout one through three and then one that actually says you have a Pike County on it. Our ordinance was put together by a set of Arizona attorneys that follow constitutional guidelines in Arizona for ordinances and laws. Okay, it's very specific. It is bookmarked what section gives you the authority to do this in the Arizona Revised Statutes, what part of it follows both the state constitution and the federal constitution. Although a resolution is wonderful, it is just a mere opinion, we would appreciate if you would look into the ordinances that would have a strength of law and put teeth into what would otherwise be just a mere opinion and criminalize the violation of the citizens' rights of Yavapai County. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Myrna Lieberman. I come from Williamson Valley, Arizona. The people here today represent a mobilization of Yavapai County residents, voters, and taxpayers who are opposed to the School Safety Protection Bill, also known as Red Flag. Being a Jewish woman, I'm a double target for the non-law abiding and the last thing that I want to be is a defenseless Jew. Anti-Semitism has been unleashed with vengeance. The most murderous acts of anti-Semitism took place in 2019, only six months apart, in Poway, California and in Pittsburgh. Eight days ago, he, on December 10th, Jersey City, there was another deadly attack. The target was a kosher supermarket and a Jewish school. And if that wasn't bad enough, the community of Jersey City blamed the Jews for the violence against them. As a woman, the gun is the great equalizer, the adage, God made man, God made woman, but Sam Cole made, made them man. equal. <laughs> Gives me a chance. And thanks to our Second Amendment freedoms, there are women all over our great state and this nation who are arming themselves for self-defense rather than risk being victims of crime. We are responsible for our own safety. As has been said, when seconds count, the police are minutes away. Yeah, they're there to put up the yellow tape. Crime happens every day, everywhere. We hear about the brutality of fights in the streets and in urban subways. And instead of having people stop it, we have people who record it and put it on social media. This is how callous our society has become. There's violence on college campuses as mobs harass speakers. Acts of anti-Semitism have become more common on these campuses. Students curse and they spit at the teachers. Water is thrown at the police. They spit at the police. There's no respect for authority. There's little or no accountability for antisocial behavior. And when that happens, we can encourage more of this behavior. Those who espouse gun laws, they don't care about the safety of women and they don't care about children and they don't care if people are helpless in their homes. Red flag law may be well intentioned, but history shows us that laws can and did have horrific consequences. Gun registration and confiscation in Nazi Germany set the stage for the Holocaust. Disarming innocent people will not stop crime. History has shown us that in major genocides of the 20th century, at least 74 million people were slaughtered by their own governments. Each mass murder was preceded by enactment of gun control laws. Each murdered population was first disarmed, and then government went looking for an unpopular group on which to pin their problems. The United States of America is the only country in the world with a right to keep and bear arms without constitutional restrictions. For more than two centuries, it has provided a stable, free government and has been a model for emerging countries of the world. 
We are here to ask the board to approve a resolution declaring Yavapai a second amendment sanctuary county. Our founding fathers were religious, intelligent, forward-thinking men, and they are watching us today in this very room. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here today. That's going to be the conclusion of that item for us. We will be giving staff direction on how we want them to go about and bringing this back. Uh, and it'll be Mr. Brown's, uh, Vice Chair Brown's turn to, uh, to bring this before you. So uh, once again, thank you all very much for being here today to share your opinions and your concerns. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. You will see a resolution from us. Uh, thank you very much for allowing us to take a break. Um, we probably should close that door. Thank you, Mr. Van Curen. Make sure it's not locked. Can you might check it, make sure it's unlocked. Please. Yep, good to go. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Um, it's always interesting to get an item on our agenda that provokes so much emotion and uh, concern. So. Thank you all for participating in the meeting and uh, sticking around for the rest of it. Uh, we will move on with consent agenda. Uh, Ms. Mallory, do you have anything you would like to pull today? I. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I want to make sure we are there. Yes, we are. Moving all over the place. Uh, Supervisor Thurman, do you have anything you'd like to pull this morning? No. Supervisor Simmons, do you have anything you'd like to pull this morning? Nothing, Mr. Chair. Vice Chair Brown, do you have anything you'd like to pull this morning? Well, no. But we have one item that has been asked to be pulled. That is item number 12, uh, which uh, would you like to come up and do you want us to pull it and table it or did you want to present it? Okay, please come forward, sir. Let's move. Oh, well, let's hold on a Mr. second. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda item uh, list other than item number 12. Second. So we have a motion by Supervisor Thurman, a second by Supervisor Brown to approve the consent agenda as presented, minus item number 12. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chairman Garrison, members of the board. I'm Brandon Schultz, Assistant Director for the Facilities and Capital Improvements Department. Um, I asked for item number 12 to be pulled uh, just for discussion purposes. Um, we had put together a contract with the geotechnical engineer for the criminal justice building, a new facility that we were doing. And in the final throes of review, we realized we needed to add a couple more items to their scope, uh, a couple more test pit locations, increase our scope, uh, by just a little bit and added an extra five hundred dollars to the contract so you want to move this until the january 2nd meeting no so actually, you can make the correction i would love to have it and they're available to the public to review uh let's move on no again. actually if it's acceptable with the board i would prefer to uh move forward with it today so that we can get the geotechnical uh, consultant moving on the project Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve item number 12 with the adjustment that he has suggested. Second. So Mr. Had, Chairman, I move to move into the jail district board of supervisors. Uh, we, we are, actually. We are resolved by hearing this item. Uh, so hold on a second. We have a motion by Supervisor Simmons. We have a second by Supervisor Thurman. Discussion, Mr. Vice Chair Brown. Um, and be it known that we are resolved as the board of directors currently of the Yuffie County Jail District. I just think that the uh, public, since we're making a change to a contract and that something like that, that the uh, public needs to be able to be apprised of it and have it written for them so that they can review it before we move on. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert that I don't see that a $500 change for the contract of size is going to create a real stir, nor should it. But so noted. Yes. So, no, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, we uh, strive to be, if nothing else, transparent in everything we do. And I think we've been following that to a T when it comes to the discussion on our Criminal Justice Center. Uh, but as noted 
This is a very minor change. It's just an increase of scope of business. It's less than 1% of the total fee that's being allocated for this service. And uh, in order to continue on with the work that we're doing, I think it's only prudent that we move forward since there is no monumental change in the uh, contract that's being offered to us. And it will be available in its totality on our website as soon as we approve the minutes. So call the question. Yes, sir. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Pass you now. Say thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to action item number one. This is to approve the transfer of contingency fund money in the amount of $15,000 for contribution to the Verde Valley Regional Economic Organization for the Verde Valley Housing Needs Assessment. And today uh, we have Mary Shaquin here that is uh, the CEO of Verde Valley Regional Economic BB Rio, as we call it, uh, to answer any questions. This was an item I brought forward. So let me give you a little history on what we're talking about today so you fully understand what's being asked, uh, not only amongst the board, but the public as well. For a little over a year now, we've been meeting. Uh, this started out with a, a discussion between uh, the mayor of Sedona, Sandy Moriarty, and Justin Clifton, the city manager for Sedona, and, and our office on the need to start uh, looking into how we deal with workforce housing in the Verde Valley. Uh, it, has, it has become uh, stifling to our economy to deal with housing. You cannot go someplace in the Verde Valley currently that you don't have to enter into a conversation or hear a conversation about the difficulties people are having finding places to live and raise their families. So uh, it's become a, a severe problem and so we decided that we would put together a group and make this a broader conversation and bring everybody in the Verde Valley forward with this. This has also been shared and, and our purpose has been shared with the Prescott area as well and we've been in constant contact with the mayor and the city managers of not only Prescott but Prescott Valley on what we're doing and uh, how they may want to watch this and see how it would affect their community as well. They are not under quite the same stress we are over here but what we have before us is going to be everywhere soon. So uh, we brought in all the mayors and managers from all over the Verde Valley. Uh, we meet probably every other month, quarterly at least and we have uh, moved forward with discussions on how we deal with workforce housing uh, and the need of such and uh, in the Verde Valley. Uh, most of the cities uh, currently are not capable of housing the workforce within their own city limits. 80% uh, of Sedona's workforce lives outside of the city of Sedona. Uh, not a good situation when we have transportation issues, we have road issues, we have uh, just all the different problems that come with transportation transit and the need for increasing those. So uh, we met, we've been going through this. Uh, Sedona decided they would come forward and put together a workforce housing study. They went out and hired a uh, consultant to put together one. Uh, I think they're charging about 60 grand to put this workforce housing uh, study together. During the discussions at our meeting on the scope of this project, uh, we asked if, uh, and that was we as the Yavai County asked if this wouldn't be maybe necessarily a better conversation undertaken by everybody in the Verde Valley because uh, what happens in one community here affects every other community. And since most of the housing is outside of the areas of those developments or those incorporations, uh, it is it's kind of on all of us to deal with this as a regional effort. And so uh, the Yaupai County, if you haven't seen all the emails coming at you left and right, currently we're under attack over here from larger developments. Those are being pushed forward and being considered mostly because we have such a workforce housing issue over here. So the idea of this study was to go out, find out where the available lands are, find out where the workforce is living, where they're working, and what we can do to accommodate trying to find some solution to dealing with this problem. And so Sedona decided they would break it, take it back to their consultant. Their consultant agreed to make it a larger conversation and include all the communities. Yavapai County is the last one to step up and be considered as a partner in this. Uh, city, of, city of Cottonwood has ponied up 10 grand. Uh, the town of Canterbury has ponied up 10 grand. Uh, Clarkdale has put forward 4,000. Jerome 
even though Jerome has almost no housing in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, they've actually thrown some money on the kitty as well, and I believe EV Rio has been very active in going out and finding some private contributors to this housing needs assessment as well. So what you're being asked to do today is, is uh, take some responsibility in this study and the value that it brings to our citizens and the workforce housing issue we have here as well as how we're going to deal with uh, these developments as they're coming forward and give us basically the foundation to have a broader conversation on our housing needs. So, Mr. Chairman, I move we approve item action item number one as presented. Second. So I have a motion by Supervisor Simmons. We have a second by Supervisor Thurman. Any discussion? Yes. Yes, sir. Vice Chair Brown, please. Mary, can I ask you some questions? If you don't Mary, could you please step up to the podium for us, please? Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm Mary Shaquan with the Verde Valley Regional Economic Organization. Hi, Mary. Who's Hi, Craig. Who administered this, uh, this research? Who's going to pay the bills for the research? Who's the head? The head. Okay, there are. It's it's sort of a two-pronged process, as Chairman Garrison said. It started out with the city of Sedona and a team of a housing alliance coming together. And Sedona recognizes they have a desperate need for diverse housing. Now let me ask, since you said brought it up, let me ask you this question. Certainly. What's the average house in, in Sedona cost? 535. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. The question, the question would be is, is, why don't they just lower the price of their houses and then they'd be able to accommodate their workforce? No. Sir, I think that's the discussion we need to bring up with the city of Sedona. <laughs> Since it's a free country, obviously the taxpayers that are going to spend this money is not a free country to them. It's costing them something. I'm not quite sure how to answer your question. What am I going to do when I tell my constituents in Seligman that I'm paying, you know, fifteen thousand dollars for a study to be done in, in an area that is affluent? Okay. Um, would you like to answer that? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Go ahead. Please. Okay. These addresses. <laughs> there are two components to this study. The first is the city of Sedona is paying a hundred thousand dollars to do a housing study, a housing assessment study. It includes Sedona and it includes components of the Verde Valley. Okay, that when, was not in our packet, that $100,000 amount. Go ahead. I believe the information about them paying $100,000, I do not have access to their contract because it is a City of Sedona contract. When we saw the group, saw what the City of Sedona was doing, um, we spoke with them and the housing committee that we have, the alliance that represents the entire Verde Valley and said, what would it take to do an entire assessment of the Verde Valley in conjunction with what the city of Sedona was doing? And there was agreement by every one of the communities that that was a really good choice. And the cost of adding on the rest of the Verde Valley is $40,000. So in order to do the immediate area of the Verde Valley, including Sedona, Clarkdale, and all the towns and cities, is that our portion of that is going to be about fifteen thousand dollars for the unincorporated area? Correct. Okay. Correct. And as Supervisor Garrison explained, we have ten thousand already from the city of Cottonwood, ten thousand from the town of Camp Verde, four thousand from the town of Clarkdale, five hundred from the town of Jerome, and the Verde Valley is going out and soliciting private businesses, developers, etc., to also participate in this because our um, approach is, is that we work on a private public partnership in getting things done and the private business community has a great deal of investment in housing and things like that in the Verde Valley and even the each community Sedona has a team of experts or community individuals they're working with on the study we will have the same in the rest of the Verde Valley and includes the leadership of all the communities and again private industry and you as an entity, Verde Valley Economic Development, you guys are going to keep an eye on this to make sure the money is used appropriately, correct? That is correct. I mean, we were asked to take the lead as, let's call it the fiscal agent, the fiduciary agent, as a regional organization on the regional component of it. I'm actually, I guess, taking the lead, if you will, as a staff person in supporting the work of this group. Well, you know how much of faith I have. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, and, and I since, would move for the question. And, and since you brought it up, I want to make a clarification real quick for everybody. I want sure. to make sure we're not funding BB Rio. No. So we're funding a study, a study that I think will be instrumental in helping us deal with a lot of this development that's happening currently in the Verde Valley. And, and I think it'll be kind of a, a, a blueprint for the other side of the hill at, at which time they also have to attack this issue because as you know coming from Williamson Valley you're under attack as well on housing so I think it gives us the ability to, to look at it regionally figure out solutions regionally and not just make one community fight another community for how we're going to deal with our problems. Right, and I think how, how BB Rio is also approaching it I mean all, most all of you have seen the regional strategic plan that was approved a year ago this is foundational, having this research. Research is critical in the decision-making process. This is research that we need. I mean, and it's part of the component of moving forward and really, to me, designing the Verde Valley we want. And that may be so, but there's an argument whether that should be private or it should be government. Okay, and the question is that you're using government funds. That means the people of the rest of the county are using their money to support your development you see what i'm saying well and, and that's the case in most cases so but i think if you i mean i mean you you are under assault as every one of these other board members sitting up here as well right now with the developments that are happening within the Verde valley there is a an extreme need to deal with our housing situation and unfortunately the county is seen as kind of the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to developable land yes and how we're going to deal with that, which causes us density issues and, and transportation issues. And so we are part of this conversation whether we like it or not. And I think we owe it to everybody, including the citizens on the other side of the hill, to make sure that we do the right thing with the resources we have left. We have to tell and we have to tell our constituencies, no matter where they are in the county, is that we believe this is a wise thing to do for the entire county. Right, and, and I'm going to say VB Rio across the country has been a model for a lot of programs um, over time. And I mean, I would hope, I mean, I know our research that we do will be available to the entire county. I mean, we have become the resource in the Verde Valley, our website, etc., for research and things like that. So I'm hoping that it can be a template, that it can be used elsewhere. Um, I mean, our philosophy is we're going to keep asking because we think this is a good thing to do for the Verde Valley and hopefully for the whole county. Great. Okay. We have, uh, you have a I just yes, want to say that I appreciate all the contributions made from everyone as the list went on. Um, we will not be able to accomplish are things that we need to do in this county without partnerships and that is very clear to everybody i'm sure call for question uh, okay, 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 okay one, one last statement is that i have yes, been sir. in contact with yavapai college yes. and they would love to partner in on this yes. too they're on the list okay good thank you <laughs> uh we have had the call for question asked so i will ask uh we have a motion and a second all in favor say aye aye opposed say nay Pass unanimously. Good luck, and we look forward to thank seeing the fruits much. of this challenge. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, the next item up will be to approve the amended Yapai County Emergency Operating Plan. Good morning, Mr. Cherry. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board. How are you all doing today? Great. 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 Uh, so I uh, um, have before you here uh, the um, recently amended, revised uh, emergency. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move you. Uh, approve the Yapai yeah, County Emergency Operations Plan. I've read it and I'm very satisfied. I'll second that. We have a motion by Vice Chair Brown. We have a second by Supervisor Simmons. Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much for having a very self. thorough presentation. Yeah. We, <laughs> we absolutely, and, and not to take light of this, we do appreciate the work that, that you do and your department does to make sure we're prepared for emergencies. And this plan lays out very simply how, how we're going to provide those services to our community. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you very much. Not a lot of changes, I might add, but very good. The next item up will be a hearing. We have uh, development services. We have a request for consideration of use permit to allow the use of an on-site on -site well to serve the Montezuma and Rimrock Water Company system on an approximate legal non-conforming 0.22 acre lot in an R1L10 residential zone area. Good morning.
Good morning, thank you, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Tim Olson, planner with Yavapai County Development Services. Uh, today I'll present the application for use permit Montezuma Rimrock Well Company, well number four, application number H19045. Property is located in the Supervisor Thurman's District, District Number Two, in the Rimrock area. It's an area map. The area map showing the location of the subject property being situated in Lake Montezuma Estates, Unit Number Two, on the west side of Timon Lane in the community of Beaver Creek. The uh, Lake Montezuma Estates, Unit Number Two subdivision was recorded in 1968 the lots were platted within the intentions of developing a water and water system and utilizing the individual sites of individual on-site water systems or wastewater systems <clears throat> this is a zoning map the map shows the uh, zoning of, 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 of and around the subject property uh, to be uh, the R1L10 residential single family limited to 10,000 minimum square feet, uh, which allows the a matter of right the approval of the subject system and a private domestic well <coughs> on one single family dwelling unit, in addition to accessory uses structures permitted in the R1L zoning district. This is the site plan. The uh, applicant has requested the consideration of the use of permit to allow the use of on-site well on a .22 acre lot to serve the Montezuma uh, Rimrock Well Company <coughs> and the R1L10 residential single family limited 10,000 minimum square feet zoning district. This is a uh, landscape plan. The applicant is requesting a waiver for solid screening in order to install a, slat a, a slatted chain link fence with a gate for privacy and security purposes, including uh, Italian cypress trees. <coughs> this is the front of the property looking west, southwest. This is uh, Time and Lane, uh, lane uh, looking south. So the property is, a, uh, is uh, accessed from Time and line. This is looking west, rear of the property. This is looking east and northeast of the property, on the property. well looking south. This is the well looking east. This is the latest um, survey submitted by the applicant dated August 7, 2014. This is a map that shows the properties that fall within 3,000 foot buffer line. The applicant has contacted the surrounding property owners within a three, uh, the 300 foot buffer line um, subject to the property. The applicant has also held a meeting uh, at the subject property on July 22nd, 2019, approximately at 2.30 p.m. The meeting was announced in a letter of intent as citizen uh, participation as well. And as of writing this, staff has received a petition from the uh, July 22nd, 2019 open meeting with seven signatures uh, of support and one in opposition, along with six letters of support, four letters of opposition regarding the request. In summary, uh, the applicant is requesting the uh, consideration of the use permit to allow the use of an on-site well on a 0.22 acre lot serving the Montezuma Rimrock uh, Water Company system in an R1L10 residential single family limited to 10,000 minimum square feet zoning district. 
The applicant is also uh, requesting a waiver of the solid screening fence in order to install uh, slotted uh, chain, slots in the chain link fence uh, with a gate for privacy and security. These are some of the suggested uh, stipulations. Uh, should the board find that the proposed use is an appropriate land use of the property and choose to uh, approve the uh, Rimrock Water, Rimrock, I've got to get it down, Rim, Montezuma Rimrock Water Company, well number four, use permit H19045, the following conditions of approval might also be considered. <coughs> that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions for me, I'm here to answer them as well as the applicant. Board members, do you have any questions? Uh, I always like stated uh, when you give a presentation what the Planning and Zoning Commission vote was. I, I, <coughs> I always like that statement. I, I can go ahead and take that, Mr. Chairman and uh, Supervisor Chairman. Uh, the vote was six to three in favor of this particular application. Um, one of the things I did want to go ahead and add, just uh, ever so briefly, is the location of a commercial well within a residential community is very common across this county. Staff doesn't find this to be a detrimental use and actually does find it to be in keeping with most neighborhoods as well. So just wanted to put that out there for you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple <coughs> items real quick for you. Um, one is, <coughs> we're talking about a waiver for the screening. Can we not modify our code to, to do away and I, and so this is a this is a national security issue with the screening and and so we know this is going to be a problem mm -hmm. we know we we have to modify what we do on wells can we not just remove that from our code because we're going to be constantly dealing with this um, we can't have them we can't have them hidden from the public otherwise uh, we have security issues so yeah and, and that's, that's like certainly a uh, fire code that, that's certainly something the board could look at today as far as this specific application and staff would be happy to go back and include that in the, the many ordinance amendments we're working on as well thank you sir another thing is um i hope you understand i think you do the how cute acutely aware the board is currently of density mm -hmm. and looking at those pictures uh, i was I've been through that area numerous times, but I, I guess I'm just becoming a little more aware of density. What's what? What is our density in that area? Do you have I, any off the top of your head? The density for this uh, the density for this area is R1L 10,000 square feet. So we, so we would, would be looking at in that four to five range, depending upon the layout of the lot. Right away, typical for Beaver Creek area. Typical for the Beaver Creek area. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's kind of what I was after. Just yes. a clarification. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Yes, sir, Vice Chair. <coughs> Uh, just go back to the map. Which which one? One that that indicates one? for and against. Uh, which one is the uh, sorry the uh, Apache Nation's uh, proper? Uh, yeah, my Apache Nation is not on land within this 300 foot ring. So why did they comment? Uh, the Yavapai Apache Nation has sent comments in on this case as well as other zoning cases. So just as part of the public comment period, uh, those comments were solicited. As we oftentimes have comments outside of the notification ring, you know, we write issues well. primarily regarding the water usage. Yes, issues were related to water usage and not a zoning question. And who are the two that are opposed? I believe this one. That's uh, confusing what you have up there now. Yeah, parks yeah it's, it's yeah, not yet by Apache Nation. That I believe, is, I believe this one is Ivo Badecki, uh, and I believe this one may be Mr. Doherty's property. The letters that we have received but we won't receive the two letters so the gentleman across the street is right across the street from the well so that's correct any other questions uh, do we miss olson you have the right to come up and address the board if you should choose to um welcome mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Patricia Olson. I am the owner and operator of Montezuma Rimrock Water Company. Um, I actually had a few things to make statements on, but uh, your staff did an excellent job. Unless you have any other questions for me? Uh, I could, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Supervisor Thurman. First of all, I'm going I'm to slap your hand because you drilled a well without permissions. And so I don't like, even though you are a uh, a commodity to the neighborhood you are a water provider that is necessary and you have how many people do you have on your system right now I have 230 customers 230 customers 
Uh, the uh, Arizona Water Company has a well just across the other side of the creek from this one. Uh, this well is to uh, help with the infill that we're seeing in the Avapai County right now. The area is uh, more affordable in that area than the bulk of the county is. So there's going to be growth in there. We know that we know that it. Uh, I don't have any problem with the fence either, but I do have a problem with it being all the way around the property line because it really makes it look commercial-ish. Uh, and I also have a problem if you ever wanted to put a 20 or 50,000 gallon holding tank there because that really looks commercial-ish. Uh, I believe that the board uh, per state statutes does not have the right to do okay or not okay something because of the availability of water. And so this, is, this comes under that, guys. Uh, my want from you and see what you say to this is, uh, and I'm willing to make a motion to approve this, if, if you so would stipulate that you do not put some gigantic water tank there for one and i understand because of security reasons and the building that the well is going to be housed in you got to have a little building there but if you could keep it the least amount of distance that you can have to have for that fence that it doesn't go all the way to the lot line all the way around you see where i'm getting at i'm trying yes. to stop the big commercial <coughs> in a neighborhood that hasn't had that for all these years Yes, I agree. Um, your, in your response to um, uh, the storage tank, uh, we have a transmission line from that uh, well site that goes to our main well site. Any water that's used from that well will have to go to our main well site for treatment. So there will never be a storage tank there. I would like that in, in the, in the, emotion, in the uh, conditions of this a permit yeah, yeah if you're okay with that and then shrink the size of that to whatever you need just to make secure because of the country today as it is a state to do that you get people that shouldn't be in there in there if you just had trees and so uh, if you could keep that to a minimum that you just need to protect that well site uh, I agree you good on your right I, I also am gonna ask for permission if I can put trees around the whole property the perimeter then that you know if you want to beautify that's up that's up to you so okay okay uh, let me let me back up to one more thing uh, we got to understand that the Avapai County uh, Board of Supervisors and the Avapai County Development Services does not have a hydrologist on board uh, we cannot say one way or the other that uh, this well is going to have arsenic we're not going to say one way or the other it could dry up other wells because we are not professionals in that. That's Arizona Department of Water Resources and ADEQ. They're the ones that will have to monitor this. And if something goes south here, it's their responsibility to take care of it, not the liability of this county. So with that, I'll make the motion to approve the change stipulations that you are going to add. Second. Well, okay, before we get there, please, we, this is a hearing, so oh, you got uh, green we, we do oh, have sorry. people that would like to comment. And okay. so are there any other questions for Ms. Olson before? I have a couple. Yes, sir. Okay, one of the things is, is according to this, if we approve this, you'll be able to sell the property and the wells before you reach the third year permit issuance isn't that right uh, I guess I could but so all these things you say you're going to do Sorry, you may not necessarily block. have to do if you sell the entire property in the okay. well service well I have no intention of selling but that that is a option I wouldn't I'm not considering it that at all though okay I agree with uh, mr. Thurman that you know we're not going to tell you to landscape it but that would be better than the fence mm -hmm. And let me ask you another question, or actually I want to ask Dave this question. Dave, if, the, if this had been the old well ordinance, would this well have been illegal or legal? Under the uh, old well ordinance, I believe this well may have been illegal. I'd have to look at that specifically. Okay. That's it. Any other questions for Ms. Olson? Thank you, ma'am. Um, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we have Ronald Melcher who would like to come up and speak. Also, you have been given a letter by Mr. Doherty, who is one of the neighbors contesting this. Uh, so hopefully you've had a chance to peruse that as well. Mr. Melcher, thank you for being here this morning, sir. Good 
Good morning, I'm Ron Melcher. I live in uh, Lake Montezuma, Arizona. And Mr. Chairman and Supervisors, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm here as, uh, I'm the Secretary of the Beaver Creek Community Association, and I'm here representing that association. All of the uh, uh, customers on uh, the Montezuma Remont Water Company reside in the area served by the Beaver Creek Community Association. And so we feel a little bit of an obligation there. Uh, and uh, I, we've heard and we've watched uh, uh, stuff on this well and this piece of property go back and forth and whether it's placed well or not placed well on that property. But you know, uh, small water companies in Arizona are a tough place to make, a, to make money. And, uh, and this well is drilled, the pump is in it, and the customers, uh, the 230 uh, customers on the water system deserve to have clean, fresh uh, drinking water uh, consistently. And we're concerned that without this well, there could be uh, failures at times to make that water available. So, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, so this has been, we've added a couple stipulations that the applicant seems to be uh, okay with adding, which would be uh, some modification of the fencing as well as some additional uh, landscaping that uh, you were going to do anyway, and the uh, stipulation in there that there will be no tank on site for the foreseeable future that would be handy and i apologize mr chairman i don't have a keyboard no no to, we're to good as long as you noted if, if i could go ahead and just note uh, from the staff's point of view what i'm hearing is that we would add a stipulation number six to include no storage tanks um, other than pressure tanks you have to have one. other than pressure tanks no storage tanks other than pressure tanks allowed on this property and then we would modify stipulation number two um waiver of screening waiver of screening requirement to allow for uh chain link fencing and what i would say is uh chain link fencing um in the least intrusive manner as determined by development services with perimeter parameter yes uh, uh least intrusive footprint perhaps right yeah that does do that least intrusive in, footprint in parameter uh landscape Yes, we're just we can, trying to make sure she remains a good neighbor. Yes, that's exactly. Right. We can make sure. That's yes, yes, sir, Vice Chair Brown. Why, why three years? Why three years? The, uh, five. That was part of the uh, discussion with the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission voted to increase it to three years. What was the reasoning? Um, I believe the reason Usually at any kind of construction is usually a year, so when yes, we're looking at here, we're taking three, and this has already been constructed. It, the well itself has been So constructed. I don't have to put in my chain link fence or my bushes or anything like that for three more years? Well, I would ask that the chain link fence be installed as soon as possible. I think she's probably willing to do that. But there's other state licensing requirements that do have to come into play uh, to take care of that. That's why we put in the three years. Yeah, and I believe that That's is what exactly the, the reason for the three years. That was a discussion. State licensing process is because of domestic wells. Or ADEQ, right. yes. The, the time it takes to get through the state process yes. anymore. It has nothing right. to do with the and, and quite frankly, if the board would be interested, we can add into the waiver of screening a time frame for that screening to go in if uh, Ms. Olson would be amicable to that. I think, I think we're good. I think it's cool. I think we're okay. good. I think we all understand each other. Too much to lose. Any other questions for either the applicant or Mr. Williams? Uh, we'll go ahead and call the question. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have no. two opposition, three in favor. Uh, Vice Chair Brown and Supervisor Mallory voted against. Uh, Chair Garrison, Supervisor Simmons, Supervisor Dunn voted for, so we are approved. Thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Uh, the next item up, we will have the approval of a liquor license, uh, Department of Liquor License Control Series 18 Craft Distiller application for Eric Lomsky of Page Spring Cellars. We have a motion by the Chair, and I believe a a uh, second oh, yeah. by Supervisor Thurman. This is my, is my district. district, you guys. <laughs> no, do you have any discussion or concerns? This, I do not see any. I have one concern. Yes, sir. I think really that uh, Supervisor Simmons is 
start counting the amount of liquor stores in the district. Paybacks. <laughs> hey, hey, yeah. Well, as you can see, we're running out of water. We've got to go to something. So. That's okay. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Passage unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, you. We will now move on to a presentation by Amber Stewart, the recruiting assistant with the U.S. Census Bureau. Thank you very much for your patience, ma'am. Oh. You were up. Yeah, actually. I was going to say that should have been changed. I apologize. Oh, no worries. Come on up, Kim. Thank you. I'm actually Kimberly Robinson. I'm a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, my territory is northern Arizona. Thank you very much. And I'm based out of Blackstaff, Arizona. All right. This is all about the 2020 census and what you should know about the 2020 census. Why we do a census. It is federally mandated. A lot of folks actually don't know that it's in the Constitution that for every 10 years that we will go around, the U.S. Census Bureau will go around and count everyone in the United States. We've been doing that since 1790. And the numbers that you get from your census stays with your community for 10 years. Keep in mind that your census form is confidential. All census employees, regardless of their position, are um, are sworn to confidentiality and privacy for life and your information is protected by title 13 of the u.s code we never share information with other government agents agencies and also all your information is purely statistical it is all guarded for 72 years so in 2022 look for all those ancestry websites to do a big push to have you come back to them because the census information from 1950 will be released in 2022. your congressional representation is affected by your census numbers so everything that the board of supervisors everything that y'all have been talking about the numbers the dollars all that uh, census touches all of that information that you get you distribute money based on your census numbers a lot of times and here is our road to the 2020 census beginning march 12 2020 you'll be able to respond online for the first time ever the census will be online you can also respond via phone so there is a big push for march 12 2020 if you don't want anyone knocking on your door please go ahead and fill out your census form as early as possible if you're tired of seeing me fill out your census form as soon as possible if you no longer want to speak to me fill out your census form as early as possible uh, march 12 2020 is the internet self-response but there are different ways that we will get your information if you don't want to fill out your form via the internet or call it in or if you're in a situation where you do not have a mailbox for example you were never given an option to have a home mailing address you only have p.o boxes starting in mid-march you will get an invitation to respond postcard and or you will go ahead and get your census form now the official census kickoff day is april 1st however not everyone has home mailing so again if you do not have a mailbox in front of your home at all or if you were never given that option you only have a p.o box then you will either get a census worker at your door or you can respond online or via the phone we'll start reminding people later on in march and if you haven't responded yet you'll get another postcard and beginning in, at the end of april we'll send you a final reminder and then the folks that we call enumerators your census takers will start knocking on doors now keep in mind that the census is federally mandated so the no trespassing signs to get off my property things like that we can't heed those signs because we're there to do um, a task that has been mandated by the u.s constitution so here you go again up to five mailings to a household again this will change a little bit if you do not get home mailing if you only have a peel box your last day to respond to the census is july 31st 2020 so you have a very active complete count committee here and those are the that's a team of folks that come together to make sure that Yavapai County is counted and David Williams Jeremy Dye among others have been very active for quite some time quietly suffering with me to get the census done thank you y'all have been very proactive it's been wonderful yes, um, just a quick question for yes. clarification would it be per is it an interview per home that is correct it is uh an interview. so it's not everybody in the house it's just one person 
the head of household, so to speak, and that someone that identifies him or herself will be the person responding to the questions. That is a little difference when you go to things like group quarters, dormitories. Um, you will also have some different situations where everyone in the house, for example, if you have a group of students living together, unrelated groups that stay together, they can go online and respond to the census separately. But our preference is for every household, there's one person. Also, so you're aware, and maybe you are, but there's, pe there's folks that live in District 4, and I'm not picking on District 4, but there's folks uh -huh. there that really need really, really need to have a deputy with them when they go out to some of these private properties because they're kind of notorious to say the least absolutely and I, based out of northern arizona 95 percent of my territory is very rural i live in a rural area myself in flagstaff unfortunately we cannot have law enforcement accompany our, our numerators because of confidentiality issues really that's correct actually what we are asking for um especially with our complete count committees is that you have someone that we can reach out to quickly if there's a problem. Um, again, if someone does not want to be approached, our numerators are not going to just roll up and, and just you know face down uh, someone that's threatening them. We can leave and we can come back later once you're able to verify our identity. And that has happened before. I've had people call me um, that live in rural areas with my, my phone number, I make it readily available. And they've asked me to identify someone or they've received an American Community Survey and they're not sure what that is. Can you hang something on their lock gate that says, please call, this is just a census worker type of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. With, the, with that list of requirements, things that we do, we go and knock on the door for reminder postcards and all that. Um, if you don't have a mailbox, what we'll do is leave a census form for you and you can fill it out. However, keep in mind, if we don't hear from you at all, then someone will have to come onto your property. and the the worst case scenario is that we absolutely don't hear from you and you have um a form an incomplete form or you're not accounted for in the so, so you're going to put these postcards in the po boxes of the people that don't get mail delivery so they know you it can be a postcard and or the census form right there because we know and and you're going to get if you only have a post office box someone is going to come to your home and you're going to have a form left anyway, for you most right of them so, fill out the one in the post office box Right, that would be that a reminder. Right, well, it would be a reminder. However, you're not going to get a census form in your post office box. What we'll do is we'll have to come visit you come March 12th. You can fill out the form. This is for folks that only get mail via post office box. So to, to make your job easier, though, would be this this post, because I live where there's no mail delivery. Uh, this So if, it, if there's a notification at the post office that you need to do that, on that notification, I would imagine there's a website that if you want to do that. So that would save that census worker from coming to anybody's house if they've done it online. That is correct. Prior to that date. That's right. So, so March 12th, when you get a postcard, there will be a 12 digit identifying number there. Don't worry about if you lose that postcard, it's perfectly okay. You can still fill out the census form online. And yes, if you don't want, um, if you know you have an address that's really hard to find or you don't want the census workers to come out, then yes, we strongly encourage, fill out your census form online or via telephone. What if you own three or four different homes and you're at one or another now and then? We'll, we'll track Which one are you picking up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sound threatening, but we'll track you down. Oh my God. <laughs> you work for the NSA too on the side? <laughs> We, we always account for every home, uh, but that's where, again, your census team here in Yavapai County is very helpful. Your GIS specialists have been toiling uh, for quite a few months to update those addresses, but we have to account for every address. Okay, so the census is easier, as I, I, just, as I discussed, you can fill it out online, by phone, or the paper questionnaire. And if you choose to fill out the paper questionnaire, you can get in either English or Spanish. If you go online, there are 59 different, I'm sorry, English plus 12 non-English languages available online. And if you call in, there are 59 languages available now. Each of them will have a separate phone number. For your internet self-response, you have the tabs up there on top. And what you can do is pick a language based on the tab. So this is what I briefly mentioned, group quarters. Most of the counties, I, I work with four counties out of the five here in Northern Arizona. Most of you have a group quarter situation where it's a residence hall, a group home, prison, nursing homes, residential treatment centers, 
or workers camps. That's where a group of unrelated people all live together and the housing tends to be paid for by one person or it's, it's not what we consider um, a traditional family like everyone is related. Service-based enumeration, those are your mobile food pans, your soup kitchens, your emergency shelters, and what we call tinsels, targeted non-sheltered outdoor locations. Those are your folks that have the shanty towns under the bridges. Yes, we'll be counting them too. And that's again where your census team has been very active in helping us locate these folks. If you do have tinsels, um, I'll work with your census team here and we'll try to locate them. And what I do is I fill out a form and say, yes, there are a group of folks that hang out under this particular bridge. And when it comes census time, we'll make sure an enumerator's out there taking those numbers. So for questionnaire assistance sites, what assistances pops off? I'll be working with your libraries and your community centers, and that's where I'll be there helping folks fill out the census form. Not necessarily taking data. Um, I'm not going to be an enumerator. I'm, gonna take, I'm not going to take any personally identifiable information, but um, your librarians have been very helpful. I was at their big meeting earlier this week, and there will be um, technology there to help folks that perhaps don't want to call in or just need a little help filling out their census forms. So here are your critical dates. March 12th, internet self-response, May 13th, or maybe a little earlier, non-response follow-up, that means we haven't heard from you. So a census worker will be at your door. And then July 31st, drop dead date, fill out your form. Outreach materials for anyone that wants to partner with us, and also social media. So on that partnership website, you have, let me go back a little bit, you have customizable um, outreach materials, flyers, all those flyers and graphics that you saw on my slides all came from the 2020census.gov slash partners website. We are all, we are very active on social media. All of our recruiting folks and I, we put out things on social media talking about jobs and just general information. So we do look to the public, uh, your trusted voices, your known faces. We look to the public to please educate folks about the census right now. Just plant that little seed to let them know that we're not out to get you. We just want to get your numbers because it's important for your community. Yes, we are hiring. As uh, your board of supervisors mentioned, we are hiring. You can go to 2020census.gov slash jobs. We prefer to have people of the community that know that community to be knocking on doors because people may not want to see me, but they will definitely want to see Mr. Thurman. Because they like them. What do they pay? <laughs> uh, Yavapai County, sixteen fifty an hour. How much? Sixteen fifty an hour. <laughs> yes, sir. And the enumerator jobs, the census taker jobs are very flexible. You basically pick your schedule. Um, but two of the basic requirements are eighteen years old, and please have a motor transportation because you'll be driving. We're also looking out for uh, administrative folks too. You pay their. Uh the mileage to federal? That's federal correct. Federal. The uh, mileage reimbursement is 0.589 miles, uh, 5, 0.589 cents per mile. So about 68 cents. cents. That's right. Census day, April 1st, April Fool's Day. But it's no joke. All right, we're going to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And the information and customizable materials is there at 2020census.gov slash partners. Yes, you can co-brand. Um, your census team has been very active here in the Pike County, and you do have census teams, not just for the county, but you have uh, Clarkdale, Prescott Valley, and Prescott are very active, active too. Uh, they are customizing the information on the partnership portal on 2020census.gov. And this is my information uh, for all things uh, census. Uh, the lady that you mentioned, Amber Stewart, she is a recruiting technician and she is uh, all things jobs. Anything outside of that, you can reach out to me. Uh, you can call or text me. I do have folks, I did a presentation uh, for the Yavapai County Libraries and I do have a, a couple of people texting me today asking questions. Um, also, you can have this money, uh, I'm sorry, no, your community can have the money. But you can have my information for your frontline folks, like your administrative people. So if someone walks into the building when the census kicks off and they need to know if someone at the door is really a census worker, uh, I like to have all the frontline folks with my uh, that know my information so they can reach out to me quickly. We've given that information to the Sheriff's Department, I would assume, correct? Probably so. Your census team has probably mm -hmm. done that because I just most yeah. people are so, suspicious of other people usually call the sheriff directly, you know, on nine one one or something like that. If they're aware of the census people being out there, then they would be able to, you know, 
let people know in advance so we don't have sheriff's deputies running all over the county to these false calls. That's very true. And actually, your census team here in Yavapai County has engaged the law enforcement. I've seen them at the meetings, mm -hmm. and I also reach out personally to all law enforcement so they know my face, they have my information too. Good. Let, let one question. If, if I'm not counted, how much does that cost the county? Approximately over the your numbers uh, were correct. It would be over twenty thousand dollars per person. So uh, it is very important if for every one person that you that does not get counted. That's a road that's going to be not fixed. It'd be longer deferred maintenance. Your Title One schools are around. Your free meal programs, even things that you don't think touch you, um, all the way down to interest rates for home loans. Companies use census data for this. Uh, so if your community planners are trying to get a, a playground built or a recreation center or a community center built, if the numbers don't back it up, they're going to have a really hard time unless you want to see me again in 2025 and have a recount for that the county will have to pay for. So yes, it's very important, extremely important to get these census numbers. So not all heroes wear capes, but all heroes fill out their census forms. I, I, I haven't <laughs> read this new one. Is there is there uh, income demographics as a question? Income demographics is not a question on this particular census form, the decennial census form. Income is a question on the American Community Survey, which we put out sporadically to about 30% of the population, and that's what people call the long census form. It asks a lot of questions. Okay. And then the next question, when will the official stats come out? The official stats, you will start seeing them at the county level, perhaps April 2021. We deliver the stats to the White House December 31st, 2020, and then um, lots of decisions are made, discussions are to be had, and then probably at the county level, you'll start seeing them around, and it depends on what your state's going to do. So, so you're saying April 2021, so April if we're going to readjust by force uh, the precinct lines for uh, elections, it would probably be in 2021 then? It will be in 2021 because that's when your data starts coming out. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Thank you very much for thank sharing. So this much. is vitally important for us, and so I appreciate your time coming here and sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who we go to the exec session, Mr. Chairman? We thank have you. a motion by Supervisor Simmons. We have a second by Supervisor Thurman to move into the executive session. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Session. Thank you very much. And Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy holidays, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, all that stuff. All the rest of the